I'm in the middle of repairing this Petriflex 7 at the moment and I thought I'd pause for a bit to make a video showing some of the tools I use when repairing cameras. This definitely won't be a how-to video and there are often multiple ways to achieve the same thing so don't treat any of this as a definitive list. Item number one has to be screwdrivers. I don't think I'd get anywhere without those. I've got various sets of fine screwdrivers, but often the tips are far too thick to be of any use, so I generally hone them on an oil stone until they're usable. I've got a set that I've had for many years that are used for most jobs, although they don't go below 1.4mm, so I've also got an old set of jewellers or watchmakers screwdrivers when I need to go smaller. The two crosshead drivers in this set also happen to be JIS, or Japanese Industrial Standard, which is handy as many of the cameras I work on are Japanese. I also have this newer set of JIS screwdrivers, which also come in handy. Probably the next thing on my list are tweezers. These are invaluable for picking up tiny things. I tend to use this crank pair most of the time, and occasionally this even finer straight pair, although I do have others too. For certain jobs I want to hold an item while keeping both hands free. For that I've got these spring-loaded tweezers with ceramic tips. These are also great for holding wires and things while you're soldering them, leaving your hands free to hold the soldering iron and the solder. Cottonbud's methylated spirits and IPA are probably next on my list. I doubt there's a single camera that I've worked on without these. I also have a bottle of 70% IPA to 30% distilled water for cleaning optical parts, along with pure distilled water for the same purpose. A pen and paper is another thing I will always use. I'll make notes as I dismantle things, and then refer back to my notes when it's time to reassemble. The notes are also useful in the future if I have to do the same or a similar job. Along with that, I take photos on my mobile phone to help me remember what an assembly looked like before I took it apart. I never like to just throw all the parts I've taken off into a pile, so I use small containers to keep components organised. For cameras, I usually use plastic milk bottle tops, which are totally free. I'll also store components and the bottle tops containing them in one of these storage containers if I'm going to be walking away from the project at any time. This reduces the risk of accidental spillage of tiny components. One of the air blowers and various brushes come in really handy for getting dirt and dust out of the camera. I have a completely different set of much softer brushes to use on optical surfaces. A knife of some kind often comes in handy, and it's not only for cutting things. It can also be useful for easing up the leatherette trim on cameras, scribing lines on components, and probably many other things that I can't think of right now. A magnifying glass, reading glasses, or any other sort of magnifying device are a must-have as far as I'm concerned, because sometimes you need to get in really close to see what's happening. I often stack two pairs of reading glasses on my nose to allow me to get in really close, but I try to restrict how long I do this for because it probably isn't that good for my eyes. When I'm doing any oiling, and this applies to other small items, not just cameras, I'll carry a small amount of oil to the part I'm oiling, either on the tip of a screwdriver or a bit of wire, or I've even got these clock oilers that come in various sizes for carrying a tiny amount of oil to a specific area. And I guess while we're talking about lubrication, there are many parts on cameras that just need a wipe of dry molly paste rather than grease or oil which would make them drag. I'll often apply a tiny bit of dry molly paste using the end of a cocktail stick or similar. In this case, it's one of my cotton buds with the cotton removed. The good old lens wrench is useful, and not just for lenses. It quite often comes in handy on the cameras themselves. And the lens vise. This is used just for straightening damaged filter threads on a lens that's been dropped. There are other ways to do this, but the lens vise can come in handy at times. I'll often need to remove the name ring from the front of a lens. You can buy specific friction tools for this job, but I usually cut a ring of rubber sheet and stick it to a suitable holder, such as the dished bottom of a medicine container, and that does the same job. 
I did have a particularly stubborn lens one time, so I 3D printed a holder and glued a rubber ring to it in order to get the lens apart. The same rubber sheet is really useful for gripping other parts that need to be unscrewed, and quite often I won't need any additional tools. When I'm dismantling a lens I like to use a suction device to lift the glass elements out, rather than just tipping them out onto the table or into my hand. On some lenses you may get several elements and spaces falling out at the same time, and then you won't necessarily know what order or orientation they should be in. You'll then be left with a fun game of trial and error before the lens will focus correctly again. One thing that often causes problems are parts that are screwed in too tight to undo by hand, but there's no provision to use something like a lens wrench. The battery hatch on this Petri was a good example. The battery had leaked and the hatch was stuck solid. The battery hatch protrudes through the top cover of the camera, so I couldn't remove the cover for better access until the hatch was unscrewed. So I made another of my collet wrenches, or whatever you want to call them, which is just cut out of a bit of scrap steel. This grips the entire edge of the battery hatch, allowing for more leverage than I could get otherwise. And then the job was as easy as anything. I've made several of these before, and hopefully one day I'll have all sizes covered. And carrying on with the theme of custom tools, often cameras will have items with the two driver holes that are too small for the lens wrench. If these aren't very tight, I can sometimes get away with using this old pair of dividers, which can be adjusted to any size. But if the screw is tight, they just tend to twist and come out of the holes. In those cases, I'll customise an old screwdriver to convert it into a pronged spanning driver. I buy up old rough screwdrivers when I see them specifically for this purpose. When I was working on an Olympus Pendee last year, the middle element group and a lock ring on the rear of the shutter assembly wouldn't budge, or at least they wouldn't when using the lens wrench, which tends to be a bit too flexible at times. So I made a couple of wrenches specifically for the job. These are again just cut out of a random piece of steel, with the blade edge filed down in thickness so it fitted the slots. This gave me much better grip and control, and the rear lock ring soon came off. That still left me with the middle group to remove, but I simply couldn't get enough grip on the shutter housing, and I didn't want to damage any of the linkages and levers protruding from the shutter assembly. So again it was time to make a tool for the job. This time I wanted something that would grip the shutter body with cutouts so it avoided the linkages. And here we have it. A piece of 18mm plywood with a hole board in it to fit around the body and cutouts to miss the linkages. There's enough flex in the wood so I could clamp it round the body and use the other tool in a very controlled manner to undo the middle group, without the risk of slipping and damaging anything. There's only a couple more things that I can think of off the top of my head. Sometimes I'll need to check that a camera is focusing correctly, particularly on a rangefinder or viewfinder camera that I think someone has meddled with in the past. So I made myself a piece of ground glass to sit on the film guides, allowing me to check the focus before wasting a film. This is just some random glass that I cut to size, ground the edges on sandpaper to remove the sharp bits. I actually made two of these, I then stuck one down to a flat surface, applied some cutting paste and rubbed the other one on top of it until they were suitably ground. I made a bigger one for medium format too, although this one I made out of a bit of perspex instead, because I was in a bit of a hurry that day. And lastly, shutter timing. I can judge the slower speeds by ear, but it's not so easy on the faster ones. You can tell quite a bit just by operating the camera with the back open while pointing it at an illuminated subject, but I wanted a better way. One method I use on an SLR camera is to remove the lens, open the back of the camera, and then use this crude gasket that I made to seal a digital camera and lens up to the film plane. I would then set the camera I was testing to bulb, open the shutter, and shoot with the digital camera at a given speed of, say, 250th of a second. Then, without changing the aperture or ISO on the digital, I'd set it to something like a 2 second exposure, and the camera I was testing to 1 250th. 
trigger the long exposure on the digital and fire the SLR at 250th during that period. From the two images I could quickly see if the exposure was more or less the same. I'd then repeat this at other speeds to confirm they were working about right. Of course, what I really wanted was an electronic shutter timer, so my brother and I, well my brother mostly, made one. We did consider making one with three sensors. That system would give a better indication of problems such as a dragging shutter curtain, but we figured a single sensor would be easier to make and would be plenty good enough. So this is what we came up with. There's a laser on an adjustable bracket at the top and a photo transistor at the bottom. I just sit the camera on the unit with the back open and fire the shutter and it gives me the shutter speed as a decimal. So I'll turn it on and grab a camera to test. I'll use this Nikon F301 because it has relatively accurate speeds. I'll need to stick a bit of plastic in it to make it think the back is closed and when I first press the shutter it'll fire several times to advance the film. And now I can turn on the laser and fire the camera and we get a reading of 0.00443 which equates to 1 226th of a second. The camera is set to 1 250th of a second so that's close enough for me. And that's more or less it. There will be other tools that I use but it'll just be stuff that I already have around the place. Anyway I'd better get back to working on the Petri now. Hopefully I'll do a video showing this camera in action sometime, but at the moment it isn't very well. Amongst other things, the grease in the winding mechanism has gone solid. That's an easy fix, but someone has tried forcing it, breaking off this pin from the winding gear in the process. That gear is located right down under here, so all this lot has got to come off yet, and success will depend on whether I can make and stake in place a suitable replacement pin, and for that matter if the gear itself isn't too badly damaged. Anyway, that's about it for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.